Um, you may find this lecture completely dinosauric because the only PowerPoint you are going to see is what you see in front of you. So for the younger people in this auditorium, I plea for some forbearance because I know without pictures, it's difficult to concentrate. <laughs> so, George Massa thought, spoke, and wrote prodigiously, pioneeringly, and almost always provocatively. He did not neglect high culture. Indeed, he himself embodied the enlightened Bildungstradition, which he so often re referenced. But what stands out above all was his singular role in literally redefining the field of intellectual and cultural history. He consciously departed from the somewhat elitist and rarefied approach of traditional Ideen Geschichte, with its inbuilt bias towards abstract ideas and a kind of progressive Hegelian rationality, and turned to subjects like popular literature, myths and symbols, ideologies of irrationalism, youth movements, muscle-building gymnastics, nose-straightening surgery, something I never took advantage of but perhaps should have. More than anything else, he uncovered the crucial role of normative stereotypes and their excluding mechanisms. Apart from these substantive and methodological contributions, his monographs and more specialized studies covered a wide range of both time period and subject matter. His first works were centered on the early modern period, on the struggle for sovereignty in England, on the Reformation and popular piety, and the problem of reason of state and Christian casuistry. Later, however, from the early 1960s, he turned to topics that in one way or another had much more obviously affected his life. It was just prior to this turn that a colleague famously answered him, George, how come that you are so interesting and your books are so dull? <laughs> Though George himself didn't agree with that verdict, there is no doubt that his impact has been mainly on the later period. Indeed, he admitted, and this is in his memoir, that as a new immigrant, he first needed time to assimilate to his new environment. And so he said, after two decades in the United States, I now quote from his, his memoir, there was no more need to immerse myself in a respectable Anglo-Saxon subject in order to distance myself from my past as an outsider. From then on, a virtual flood of works ensued on Folkish ideology, fascism, Nazism, the Holocaust, German history, Jewish history, Zionism and anti-Semitism, monuments, secular religion, mass politics, liberalism, socialism, the role of intellectuals in politics, and then he got into matters of war, shell shock, processes of brutalization, memory, medicine, nervousness, degenerative masturbation, racism, aesthetics, visual culture, on bourgeois respectability, masculinity, androgynes, sexuality, and nationalism. That's quite a load. They, these are indeed very varied topics. For all that, I think they possess a certain unity, linked, I would say, by a driving critical concern with constricting processes of inclusion and exclusion, with ideal and anti-types, with straight-jacketing definitions of normalcy and abnormalcy, <coughs> propelled always by his enlightenment belief in the autonomy of the individual, and the expansion of humanizing experience and his very great concern with the defeat of humanizing experiences by mass forces of homogenization. He brought to his work a commitment and a passion 
which he said was ever more decreasing amongst his professional colleagues, whom he declared in his great accent, oh, they might as well all have been accountants. <laughs> as a German Jewish emigre, and at first as an undeclared homosexual who had experienced rejection and exclusion firsthand, there is no doubt, at least in my mind, and we can debate this, that George's evolving work had both, both generational and above all autobiographical roots. It is telling that although he regarded his first leaving of Germany in 1933, he kept on saying this, it was a form of liberation, a way of a rich man's son opportunity to make his mark independently in the world, he nevertheless ends his autobiography by ultimately defining himself as a, quote, a member of the Holocaust generation. In all his works, he never ever went into the mechanics of the Shoah. He never really detailed what was going on in the extermination process. I think he would have seen this as merely technical, but rather to the multitude of deeper lying cultural, ideological, and political building blocks that rendered the whole process conceivable, a, thinking, a thinkable possibility, which under the correct conditions could be ultimately realized. His position on this was very radical. In his retirement in Jerusalem, he said the following, all my books, and George would have this habit of saying, all my books, all my books, all my books, in one way or another have dealt with the Jewish catastrophe of my time, which I regard as no accident, structural fault, or continuity of bureaucratic habits, but built into our society and towards life. Nothing in European history, he declared, is a stranger to the Holocaust. And I've tried to de delve ever more deeply into the nature of European society through analyzing its perceptions and attitudes to the outsider. So, typically, George insisted, and he dealt with Jewish history, but he de-ghettoized Jewish history by rejecting a common ethnocentric bias that by definition, Jewish history, as so often it is done in Jerusalem, has to follow its own imminent laws. What he does is, and this you could argue to some extent, Moss's view of Jewish history actually reflected his rarefied experience as a member of the highly acculturated, wealthy Berlin Jewish elite which was quite removed from the more prosaic experiences, both of his fellow East European Jews and lesser fortunate Berlin Jews. After all, who but George could write a paean of praise entitled German Jews Beyond Judaism? That is not exactly the way in which most conventional Jewish historians write. At any rate, by linking Jewish fate inextricably to central currents of the European experience, he connected dimensions that too often were separated or compartmentalized. Clearly, the crisis of German ideology is the prime example of this approach. But over the years, an even broader canvas, an evolution of thought and perspective emerged. Over time, his work became implicitly intertwined with an emerging acknowledgement of his own minority homosexual status. While Jewish victimization remained central, even still with George, unique, the scope of analysis became ever more broader. Jews as victims now form part of a continuum, a dynamic affecting other victims. Their status and stereotype always com comprehensible alongside each other. I'll get to this a little later. But that broader canvas also hides other very significant shifts. I don't know if anyone has really paid attention to this. And this we can start then with a crisis book, 
I say the crisis book because every year when George used to visit Jerusalem, we would talk about the culture, the, the book that he was presently writing. So he would say, oh, Steve, I'm writing the culture book or the war book or the sex book or the German book. So with regard to the crisis book, E, as most of you know, it's an erudite, richly de detailed display of how folkish ideology, that semi-mystic, organic Weltschauung, with its metaphysic of eternal national rootedness, its symbolism of blood and soil, its anti-liberal and anti-urban bias, how it penetrated German culture and politics, and by focusing upon the Jewish stereotype, of restlessness, rootlessness, rootlessness, alienness. Eventually, that crisis became the anti-Jewish uh, revolution. Well, later critics, while appreciating this emphasis, have argued that George's neglect of traditional religious, Christian, and me medieval manifestations of anti-Semitism may have seen anti-Semitism too narrowly. Moreover, as original as it was, the crisis book nevertheless fitted the conventional Sonderweg paradigm of his time. This is in the 60s. For him, at that stage, German developments towards modernity were singular and differed fundamentally from the liberal democratic West. It was there that, it's anti, that it was anti-modern and it repudiated the rational European Enlightenment and the social radicalism of the French Revolution. But as he proceeded, although he never really touched the Christian roots as the animating basis of anti-Semitism, George subtly softened the Sonderberg Germanocentric explanation and moved increasingly to a much wider European canvas. Thus, his 1975 nationalization of the masses, or as he would say, masses, made it clear that ultimately fascism and Nazism were part of the broadest defining developments of political modernity, incomprehensible outside of the European wide backdrop of the fusion of democracy and nationalism and the creation of a new mobilizing liturgical politics, a visually oriented participatory counter to liberal parliamentarism, in which, even more radically, George rendered the French Revolution as complicit. That is not a usual approach. Then his 1978 towards the final solution, to be sure, render Jews again as its central victims. But it is also a much wider history of European and not only German racism. There the world is divided into normative types and anti-types. And what is most revelatory for me is the way in which he showed the major and subtle role of aesthetics rather than science as the standards of ra racist judgments rooted always in the ubiquitous ideal of Greek beauty, racists employed an aesthetic physiognomy predicated on making judgments not only about external appearance, but from their appearance, crucially, about their inner moral condition. Just as no one could claim a Greek heritage for the hunched, ugly stereotype of the ghetto Jew this was equally true, he regarded, for the thick lips, crinkly hair, and flat nose of the Negro. If Jewish looks validated an inherent criminality and sly manipulativeness, black looks confirmed an essential inner violence and primitiveness. These widening European perspectives are equally apparent in Moss's 1990 Fallen Soldiers. There, it is not the 19th century history of folkish ideology, but it is World War I with its well-nigh universal experience of mass death that takes its center stage. And in that context, not folkish tradition or ingrained ro uh, racism, 
It is rather the militant right-wing appropriation of the brutalized war experience transposed into civilian politics that becomes paramount. But George's most radical turn was not simply enlarging the historical canvas from Germany to Europe. It concerns his controversial portrait of the role of the middle classes in these developments. Although in the crisis book, George did suggest that through anti-Semitism, the bourgeoisie was integrated into the Nazi revolution. It was nevertheless the anti-urban, anti-modernity aspects that were emphasized, and the role of the middle classes not really seen as significant. However, in his 1985 Nationalism and Sexuality, and his 1996 The Image of Man, the modern bourgeoisie, at least in some of its guises, becomes an essential expression of these intolerant, fascist and Nazi impulses. From the late 18th century on, Mossa argued, nationalism and middle class morality entered into a powerful alliance, together defining modern standards of sexual behavior and other modes of respectable conduct in such a way that an ever tightening distinction between normality and abnormality was developed and enforced. Manliness then became part of normal and normative national and bourgeois self-definition. This alliance, he says, becomes increasingly totalized. So everyone gets a fixed place, the healthy on the one hand and the degenerate on the other. Virile, self-controlled men on the one side and nervous, effeminate homosexuals on the other. The sane and the insane, the energetically productive and the lazy, the settled, out, the settled native and the rootless outsider. This rigid co uh, code, he argued, was cloaked under the guise of respectability and Zittlichkeit, and it was invoked to control the reality that the alliance had itself created. I quote, Bourgeois society needed its dialectical opposite in order to exist. And it is there that George's critique of respectability becomes subversively and conceptually central. Ultimately here, Nazism is not about a peculiar German Sonderweg or even a radical Nietzschean nihilism or the Noltean revolt against bourgeois transcendence but rather about corrupted and threatened middle-class men attempting to maintain the values of healthy manliness, orderliness, cleanliness, hard work, and family life against those outsider groups who in their eyes seem morally, bodily, and aesthetically diseased and degenerate and who dangerously threatened the tenets of respectability, bourgeois respectability. Now I'm quoting again, you may think I'm making this up. The new man of National Socialism, Mossa declared, was the ideal bourgeois, and it was their antitypes, the sexual deviants, gypsies, Jews, permanently insane pe uh, people whom Hitler wanted to exterminate, and he did exterminate. And this he said in the interview, he was always most revelatory in his interviews, we said, they all look alike. They all look the opposite of the middle-class self-controlled idea of beauty, energy, all this sort of thing. Now, I would say, in, uh, parenthetically, that this was a typical brilliant Mossian provocation. George surely was aware that Nazi perpetrators understood the highly transgressive taboo-breaking, that is, highly unbourgeois nature of their acts. He would argue, I believe, that Nazism actually combined both bourgeois and bourgeois elements, and it was precisely in the combination and tension between these elements, in the fusion of the conventional and the extraordinary, 
that Nazism transcended middle class morality at the same time that it embodied it. I know that's a complex sentence. I wrote it. I'm not sure I understand it. <laughs> at any rate, as George demonstrated, especially in the image of man, middle class respectability was and obviously is not inevitably genocidal. Indeed, the force of his argument consists in delineating how middle class morality functions in much more conventional, less lethal contexts, and in which ways in which still these controlling definitions of normal and abnormal still operate. After all, the last chapter of nationalism and sexuality is called everyone's morality. So, we've looked here at some of Moss's most pointed critiques. What about his more positive commitments? What he called his points of redemption of the human spirit. He was clearly a liberal who believed deeply in the autonomy of the individual and above all, and we all know this, those of us who knew him, personalizing relationships. More specifically, he constantly emphasized that these values were clearly incarnated in the specific notion of Bildung, that untranslatable classical German idea of ethical and cultural development through self-cultivation. If for Massa, respectability represents constrictiveness, the contraction of tolerance and human possibilities, Bildung embodied the ideal of openness, the expansion of human experience. Tolerance, cultured self-cultivation, the autonomy of the individual, these were his trademarks, and implicitly he applied them as the moral measure in almost all of his works. Yet again, a very clear autobiographical impulse emerges. For ultimately, he renders the ethical history of Bildung into virtually a specific ethnic property. George's, 1990, uh, George's 1985 German Jews Beyond Judaism is an analysis of the process whereby German Jewry slowly became virtually the sole carriers of that humanizing sensibility, witness to the gradual desertion of the non-Jewish Germans of, to the, the heritage of Bildung. Indeed, for George, the German Jewish heritage, the Jewish heritage, is the German heritage of Bildung. In that sense, he does differ from the Jewish historians in Jerusalem, quite obviously, which he says became a new kind of Jewish tradition, a defining and constitutive ingredient of their post-emancipation identity. And this is because the idea of Bildung transcended any ethnic or religious definition. It was dependent upon your becoming a cultured individual and a respectable co-citizen. It is, I think, these qualities of Bildung which both as an historian and a human being, George himself exemplified, in which Jewishness for him became a metaphor for the critical, yet always humanizing and autonomous mind. German Jews Beyond Judaism is the work in which Mosse is most clearly identified, at home with his subject. As he himself wrote, this is certainly my most personal book. Almost, he wrote, a confession of faith. But George was a responsible historian, and characteristically, he retained a critical perspective on precisely that Bildung's tradition that he so praised. As he writes about the German Jews, given their almost automatic belief in the primacy of culture over politics, Bildung's Jews entirely misread their own situation and deluded themselves by projecting their own ethical ideas onto Germany that possessed a very different, quite different reality. Indeed, as he argued, while Jews were emancipated into the promises of Bildung, they were also taught to adjust to the norms and mannered uh, restrictions of respectability. <clears throat> 
So Jews eventually became caught in a vice. What was that vice? When Bildung became a nationalized, wrong page, uh, a nationalized rather than an individual value, it was very easy to stereotypically represent gesticulating, manipulating, nervous Jews as the antithesis of respectability. So in all these ways, Mossa, I think, became perhaps the most important contemporary historian of the manifold strategies of inclusion and exclusion, belonging and displacement, disdained outsiders and normative insiders. He had a conception of culture and cultural process which was determined by a dialectical relationship between the center and periphery. Moreover, and this is what made it more special, these processes were always located with what, within what George used to often call, oh, a fully furnished house. He would always talk about fully furnished houses. Despite his own liberalism, uh, History for him was a totality. The political couldn't be separated from the religious. The scientific was informed by the aesthetic. The mythological, never far from the rational. So clearly then George was not interested in history as a dry narrative, but in the big questions and the possible answers. He certainly was not a positive and not a plodding antiquarian. Indeed, as many of us know, he could very often be very cavalier with both his quotes and his stories. As his friend Walter Lacour, his co-editor who just passed away, and who with George was amongst the pioneers of what we call contemporary history, Walter correctly noted, I quote, George's spelling was uncertain in all languages, <laughs> and he had the disdain of a grand seigneur vis-a-vis -vis -vis dates in history. In a memoir about his parents, He's, he had written that his father had invited Edith Piaf to perform in Berlin in 1919. I, meaning Walter Lacour, pointed out that this seemed quite unlikely since Piaf was five years old at the time. <laughs> Did he mean perhaps Yvette Gilbert or Missonguer? Yes, of course, he said, but does it really matter? <laughs> More seriously, it is also true that his work was never immune to criticism. I'm not going to go into all of them, but just let me mention here, as just one instance, George's general portrait of Bildung and his at times idealized portrait of German Jews has received criticism from a variety of perspectives. Peter Yelovich, who is in the audience now, is one who's argued, very interestingly, that for German Jews, the higher up Bildung's paradigm itself is somewhat misleading. Jews, Jelovich proposes, were far more numerically and centrally invested in and critically important to the creation, dissemination, and consumption of popular and mass culture in Germany and not the heights of sensitive Bildung. Shulamit Volkov, on the other hand, doesn't argue with the Bildung's paradigm, but argued that German Jews were no more dedicated to its cultured precepts than other Germans, and no less prone to, German, to embrace German nationalism, despite its affinity to racism and its inherent anti-Semitism. I too have argued that at least for the Weimar period, leading Jewish intellectuals radically rejected the Bildung's paradigm of calm, gradual, essentially progressive development and adopted a far more ecstatic, revolutionary, and immediate redemptive posture. But let me add that quite untypical for the usual professor, George was remarkably open to such criticism. And at least in my case, was quite pleased with it and saw it as a testament to the seriousness with which I took his work. As long as the argument was boldly stated and did not contain what he always called, I can't stand wobbles. <laughs> if the argument didn't contain a wobble, then it had merit. And he writes, ever since I can remember, I have disliked everything mushy. <laughs> 
from personal attitudes to human bodies, even to ripe fruit. Still, however much he may have disliked wobbles, George in himself had his own wobbles. George, as everybody here is, was too a very complex figure who was very aware of his own many inner tensions and anxieties. But he creatively channeled them into his work. It is precisely this complexity, if not outright conflicts and contradictions, that rendered not only his person so compelling, but which endowed his writings with their dynamic energy and contemporary relevance. Who better to de detail the dialectics between nervousness and self-control than George? George was constantly moving, if you remember. But he understood then what is the importance of self-control. It enters into the marrow of his work. His writing of history was so vital precisely because it was an encounter galvanized by his own autobiography. I'm just going to give you two quick examples. The first and the most obvious example is in nationalism and sexuality and the image of man. It is clear that his own gayness, which he admits, was behind this concern with bourgeois respectability and its construction of normal and abnormal categories. As he put it, I have engaged with the specific outsiderdoms of which I have been a member. Yet even though in the crisis book, George was the first to discuss male eros as part of folkish thought, he only explicitly addressed homosexuality in his works in the latter part of his life. Indeed, with extraordinary candor, in his memoir, he even, he even claimed that perhaps my later works failed to suppress sufficiently my anger over the fact that the strictures of respectability have made my own life so much more difficult. That is an extraordinary statement. I know there's a discussion how revelatory was the memoir or unrevelatory. I belong to those who say it is a very revelatory uh, work. But still, the critical historian in him never allowed George's analyses to become embittered or simplistically partisan. Perhaps that is because that at the same time that he critiqued respectability, he not only personally internalized it, but he also understood its very necessity. If he advocated the expansion of boundaries and pressed for greater tolerance of minorities and sexual outsiders, he fully understood the limits of such expansion. Perhaps one could permit greater latitude of sexual expression, a relaxation of over-repressive controls, provided, he wrote, that it did not endanger respectability's power and dominance. This was so simply because, as he put it, the normative manners and morals of respectability are essential for the creation of some kind of order, for the cohesion and functioning of society itself. The second example of these tensions and inner contradictions concerns his analyses of and personal relation to nationalism in general and to Jewish nationalism in particular. How did that tension work? At the same time in which he brilliantly unmasked and critiqued the deep dangers of nationalism, he also possessed a rather profound attraction to its blandishments. His school at Zalem, he wrote, gave me a first taste of national nationalism, which at the time I found congenial. There was a danger that it might provide a belief system that I so badly lacked. And when, as a historian, much later I wrote about Jew German nationalism, I did have an insight into its truly seductive nature. Indeed, at the age of about 15, he watched a Nazi demonstration in front of his home in Berlin. The impression was so great, he wrote, that I ran away from home, must have been in 1932, and went to a Hitler rally. I must admit that even today it was an experience. I was swept away. 
First, there were the masses of people. That was very captivating to be in the middle of it all. But it was also Hitler. Nationalism as such, he understood, satisfied deep cravings for community. He systematized these insights about the power of this new mass politics, the secular religion, which he called. He loved to go down to the desert with me to Masada and say, oh, let's go down to the holy mountain. <laughs> of course, Har Sinai is more holy than Masada. Um, monuments, flags, myths, symbols, all of these were crucial for this creation. The same empathic duality applied to his understanding of Jewish nationalism, to Zionism and Israel. No one better demonstrated how Zionism embodied precisely those categories which George had exposed. He wrote, this new Zionist Jew, so different to the ghetto Jew, beautiful, don't take me as a personal example of this, beautiful, muscular, filled with energy, actually represents a normalization, an assimilation to general middle-class ideals and stereotypes. Yet he identified with the very nationalist myths, symbols, and stereotypes he sought to demystify. As he admitted, I was far from consistent. My own engagement in Israel told of the need for a more concrete embodiment of my Jewish identity. My accelerated heartbeat when I witnessed the swearing in of Israeli paratroopers on Masada, Israel's holy mountain, I'm quoting, reveals the attraction of an emotional commitment, even for one who prides himself on the use of his reason. And perhaps uh, it, it, it's, uh, he, he says such a reaction is based upon the experience and study of anti-Semitism and the constant denial of Jewish manhood. But again, he said, ideal and reality differ even within my own person. I remember vividly my joy on my first visit when I saw sturdy, self-confident Jews, though this was again a stereotype, and concluded that I myself was far more immune, far, sorry, far from immune to the irrational forces, which as a historian I deplore, and that especially when it came to my own group with which I identify. Now, part of this affirmation may have been an unstated appreciation of the need for organized force and collective self-defense in a very imperfect murderous war world, perhaps a corrective to the blind spot he identified amongst Bildung's intellectuals who confuse culture with politics. There was, he reflected, always a certain pull toward realism, to the feeling that if one did not belong to a strong nation, one could slide back into stateless, the statelessness I had experienced. I think, though, that the commitment was more primordial uh, than that, and he writes a number of times, quite strangely, said, I felt a close sense of belonging, close to love, even as I taught the lasting importance of rationality and the enlightenment. And in the end, he writes, an emotional engagement with Zionism threatened the very liberalism to which I tried to remain faithful. I want very briefly now, I am coming to the end, not to say much about George's legacy, how he's entered into the works of others or how he is not entered into the works of others, but rather what I would call his Nachleben, or the afterlife of his work. How does it stand in relation to some current wider cultural and political developments? The first concerns his thinking on masculinity and sexuality. In his image of man, George was certainly aware of, of many significant positive developments, especially the continuing erosion of the traditional masculine stereotype. I have no doubt that he would have been positively delighted by many of the contemporary changes he sees, the radical extent of which I do not think he foresaw, and I think, without exaggeration, over the last 20 years have been nothing but revolutionary, with an almost unbelievable quick time 
the constraints of sexual respectability have been remarkably relaxed. At least in many Western countries, gay marriage has become a legal fact of life. 70% of the American public now publicly supports the possibility of electing a gay president. Older sexual notions and stereotypes that previously elicited distaste, even disgust, are dissolving before our eyes. Not too long ago, the very idea of a grouping called LGBT, at first I thought it was some electronic device, <laughs> has become familiar. And this within a r unbelievably uh, remarkably time. And it has even become a domesticated collective noun. Toward the end of his life, George still felt it necessary to respect, to constantly warn. This was the last conference I was there. I think Andy was there too. He kept on repeating, beware of normalcy, beware of normalcy. In this regard, one may argue that in certain circles, the tables have been literally turned. One measure of this success, is of the success of the don't be normal, is demonstrated by an Israeli Orthodox anti-LGBT group a pro-heterosexual family organization called Gvanim, which recently posted huge billboards in Jerusalem encouraging people, I kid you not, have the courage to be normal. <laughs> it's there. I, this is not made up by me. It's kind of reminiscent of James Thurber's quip, must you be as nonconformist as everybody else? For all that, George never had a simplistic illusion about this matter. Whatever positive changes there might be, it was difficult, he, he, he maintained, to envision either the downfall or even the radical challenge to respectability and a masculinity which continued to provide the cement for social order and cohesion. Indeed, he emphasized that middle-class masculinity with its ideals of self-control, fair play, courage, quiet strength, had clear value and often served to tame exaggerated displays of male power. Regardless of their newly found confidence, George commented, many homosexuals com continue to accept the ideal and accent their own masculinity. But most importantly, he foresaw that a clear reaction to these developments would set in to the positive developments. Quite apart from the persistence of traditional homophobic attitudes and legislation in huge areas of the non-Western world, the inevitable counter-movement in the West is underway as both gayness and feminism gain the higher moral and political ground what has broadly come to be called a major crisis in masculinity has set in. I'm not going to discuss its various manifestations. The Guardian largely note, lately noted that one extreme symptom, George would have loved this, I'm not sure if you will, lately noted that one extreme symptom of the accompanying feeling of male inadequacy has been a mass demand for surgically enlarged penises. He would have liked it. I don't know about you. Some high-profile high politicians regularly preach the values of manly men, using themselves as example. We've all seen pictures of Putin's bare-chested muscular body astride a horse and heard Donald Trump trumping the prowess of his sexual organ. President Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil, who is a self-described homophobe, is also concerned about the high number, I kid you not, of penis amputations in his country. The party spokesman of the Spanish radical right movement, Fox, Vox, Francisco Serrano, a former judge, claims that at present there is a genocide against men, citing high rates of suicide of men as proof. Various intellectuals too, 
are, are helping to articulate the crisis and how to overcome it. They reach audiences of millions. Most prominent is the Canadian self-help writer, Jordan P. Peterson, dubbed by the New York Times as the most influential intellectual in the world right now, who laments that the world has lost faith in masculinity, hails the inherent value of patriarchy, and denounces the murderous equity of women. Now, regardless of how this battle will work out, there remains Georgia's much larger insight concerning society's insistence upon clear definitional order, which in some guise or another may not be sexual, necessitates outsiders. Indeed, the creation of boundaries in our present reality is not restricted to sexuality, though the present exclusions often have a sexual connotation. There's some relationship to them. The most dominant amongst them is the central cry against immigration, which is often typically tied to anti-feminist and anti-gay postures, and also to racist and anti-Jewish attitudes. We are thus currently going through convulsions of identifying, labeling, and excluding any number of internal and external outsiders. All this, then, brings us to the overriding question of nationalism, to which all these outsider issues are related. One needn't elaborate on the current populism, the coarsening of political discourse, the frightening threats to the very fabric of democracy, even the neo-fascist atmosphere that is inflaming many parts of the world. Given that, I wonder if, however sadly, George would agree that under present circumstances, his humanizing, expansive vision appears rather dim. We cannot know, um, I think, I have, to, I have to deal with this. I do have to mention that. Um, yeah. George understood that nationalism satisfied deep longings and could not be, be wished away. So his idea was, don't abolish it, but rather humanize it. Make it less aggressive, more inclusive. He even had a model for it. He had a specific historical model suggesting how he could, this could be accomplished. He insisted upon a principal distinction between what he called patriotic and integral nationalism. This he argued in 18th century, uh, thus he argued in 18th century Germany, the idea of friendship, which symbolized the autonomy of personal relations and the acceptance of individual differences and the free exercise of citizenship that coexisted with a sense of patriotism and national identification. There he wrote, solidarity, not domination, prevailed. It was only, he argued, in the 19th century that integral nationalism arose with its controlling claims of totality that gave rise to a homogenized and ever-increasing brutalized conformity. By the way, as one example, con contemporary one, that he said where it could happen again, this brings us back to his Zionism, he gave us an example that patriotic nationalism that the central European Jewish intellectuals like Hugo Bergman, Hans Korn, Robert Welch, and Gershom Scholem, who formed Brit Shalom in the interwar years and who preached a bi-national ethical solution to the Arab Jewish problem. George wrote as victims and outsiders of integral nationalism these Jews were more able to become advocates of an alternative nationalism which might keep its earlier promise. Indeed, as late as 1986, he continued to believe that this really remained an alternative possibility. That I have spent so much time investigating that nationalism which has made the Jews one of its principal victims does not mean that a nobler nationalism cannot exist. Indeed, it has existed in the past. Today, it seems almost forgotten that it was precisely those Jews I mentioned before, 
who for a long time continued into the 20th century this noble but archaic nationalism. There would have been, now listen to this, this is 1986, there would have been every reason for our own state. This is Massa talking about Israel as his own state. It's also interesting. To have capitulated before this aggressive modern nationalism, but it has not done so. The battle is still joined. We have a great opportunity based upon Jewish history and the history of Zionism to uphold the ideal of a nationalism whose essence is solidarity, not exclusiveness. Now, these are the last comments. Meliorating nationalism by reasserting the primacy of personal relationships and solidarity over domination and exclusion, they are obviously very admirable sentiments. And as an admirer of George, I certainly would identify with them. But sadly, the present situation in Israel, in parts of Europe, and the United States, not to mention various Islamic and African countries, does not really provide much succor to this vision. Indeed, the 18th century patriotism of friendship and the free exercise of citizenship of which George spoke, I fear, was always a really pale form of nationalism. Indeed, I rather think it was doomed almost from the beginning. And so, in some moods, did George. He recognized at certain moments that the combined ideals of this patriotism, liberation from foreign rule and self-determination, were not compatible. Even amongst its mo most progressive prophets, he wrote, national liberation undermines democratic self-determination. And in any case, I'm asking now, in the context of nationalism, what actually is meant by solidarity? Whose solidarity? Whose self-determination? Solidarity for and against whom? Potentially, the very notion of self-determination may negate the self who is the other. And at a different time, George himself expressed a certain skepticism. What, he asked, does self-determination mean? There are certain historical circumstances under which self-determination is either impossible or leads to more conflicts than it solves. I wonder if today, however sadly, George would agree that that vision, original vision, is dim. We cannot know. And this is the last paragraph. But what we do know is that in his own person, he was the very incarnation of that vision. And so, I just want to conclude with a few comments about George as a mensch, as a person. As much as people are intertwined with and revealed in their work, this doesn't exhaust who they are. And with George, it is his sheer overflowing humanity, so refreshingly different from the usual dry, run-of-the-mill academic that so shone out. It was apparent in his charismatic teaching, his passionate, direct, magnetically engaging, engendering thought through often absolutely outrageous, but always illuminating assertions. I think he would have been kicked out of the universities today because of their PC notions. George didn't teach PC. His humanity was apparent in his insatiable curiosity, his personalizing of relationships, his friendships with people of all ages and persuasions. Anyone who's met him will tell you of the enormous and lasting impact he has had upon them. This is testament to that fact. For those of us who were close to him, George entered into the very core of our being, so much so that when I talk to him, I'm always compelled to talk in his accent and his inimitable way of talking. This conference may be a commemoration of a hundred years of his birth, but for me, what is important is the fact that it is 20 years after his death and his presence remains really real. That's exceptional. So what explains this? Everyone, I assume, has their own George. 
so I can only speak personally of my George. Well, it's only because of him that I became an ap academic and my life has taken the path it has, but that's a different story. Quite apart from all the other qualities enumerated in this talk, my George was above all the hilarious, irreverent George with his booming voice, the sometimes raised, bemused eyebrow and the twinkle in his eyes. Who but George could worry about squirrels laying eggs in his attic? Or could sell the Mossa Schenkendorf estate to a Romanian prince called Count Dracula? It doesn't exist. My, my story started with George on the very first night I met him in 1968 at the time of the student revolution in Madison when the place was literally going on fire. And me and my friend said, George, how on earth can you talk and teach in such an environment? And he looked at me already then, he called me by my first name, he said, oh, Steve, no student revolution begins before two in the afternoon. I teach at 10 in the morning. <laughs> so it is then in his unique person, as much as his scholarship, that that is George's legacy. But one cannot institutionalize another man's humanity, his caring special brand. But I've no doubt that attempting to emulate his passion for scholarship, curiosity, his wonderful sense of the absurd, his instinctive personalizing of relationship, and his genius for friendship, that will do his legacy proud. Thank you.